Okay, first of all, I need your address. Jan Heller wants these people in Detroit who are eligible for surplus cheese to be eligible to vote. In this half hour, we examine the impact of the new electorate on American politics. If you are a registered voter, within four weeks you will be... The traditional way to change policy in this country has been to change politicians. It is an option we exercise periodically, whether we're voting for the president of the school board or the president of the United States. At least some of us do. Actually, only about half of the 164 million Americans who are eligible exercise their right to vote. Only two out of three are even registered to vote. If Jan Heller and people like her are successful, those numbers may increase dramatically during the next 18 months. Jan is part of a growing group of organizers who think new voters will make a difference. The strategy of expanding the pool of eligible voters first drew national attention in the Chicago mayor's race this spring. Congressman Harold Washington was elected there largely on the strength of newly registered voters who, once officially on the rolls, did vote on election day. Some groups, like the NAACP, have targeted low-income people because an estimated 12 million Americans who receive some government assistance are not registered. Registration drives are underway to find those voters at unemployment offices, welfare offices, or food stamp distribution points. Others, like the Reverend Jerry Falwell of the Moral Majority, are looking for unregistered voters in churches. And some people are going to high schools and colleges to sign up students as they turn 18. In a moment, we will see how Jan Heller organized a drive in Detroit to register people getting surplus government cheese and butter. These registration drives may change the way America works by creating a larger and different electorate in this country. We will discuss the effect these new voters will have on the politicians, and we will look at where new voters may be pivotal in deciding elections next year. We begin after this. Political observers have blamed the disillusionment resulting from Vietnam and Watergate for alienating voters and reducing election day turnouts. More recently, some groups are trying to get voters back into the process by convincing them that if they want to do something about the nation's economic problems, they have to register and vote. In a moment, we will discuss the implications of large numbers of new voters with Lynn Nofziger and Eddie Williams. Mr. Nofziger began his political career as press secretary to Ronald Reagan when he was governor of California. He was President Reagan's assistant for political affairs and now runs a Washington political consulting firm. Mr. Williams is president of the Joint Center for Political Studies, a nonpartisan Washington research center and chairman of the board of the National Coalition on Black Voter Participation. Before we ask them to analyze this new trend in voter registration and what it may mean for future elections, let's take a look at Jan Heller's grassroots organization and see how they are going about the task of signing up new voters. On this May morning in Detroit, the lines start forming at dawn. These people, many of whom once lined up to punch a time clock at an auto plant, are now waiting for their share of surplus food from the government. Wherever boxes of cheese and butter are unloaded these days, it is easy to find crowds of potential voters. Waiting for them at each food distribution site are organizers for the bread box, ballot box, voter registration drive. Vote today, please. Please register and vote. If you're not a registered voter, please become one. Let's get in line to vote. Then let's get in line for jobs, for better houses, and for better schools for our kids. 1983 register. All right, who's next? 1984 vote. Can I register anybody? The NAACP and Frontlash, the AFL-CIO voting project, have deputy voter registrars at six food lines around the city. The goal for the day, add 500 new voters to the registration rolls. Jan Heller has been registering voters for more than 10 years, first as a part-time volunteer while working as a secretary, now as a full-time organizer. Jan estimates she has personally signed up more than 3,000 people over the years as part of what she calls her small contribution to democracy. I'm with the bread box, ballot box, voter drive. We're out here this morning trying to get new registered voters. Are you a registered voter? No. Nope. Is there any 
reason you'd like to share with me? I didn't get anything out of it for 30 years. Why should I go on doing something that I'm not getting anything out of? In a training session, the volunteers practice their recruiting techniques and learn when to take no for an answer gracefully. This might be the time that, that your vote might make a difference. Are you just going to give up now? You, you wouldn't want to try again? Do you think you maybe should say, OK, well, if you change your mind, then uh, let me yeah, know. I think this might be, be the play. This because is a rough one. Yeah, yeah, this is probably it. OK, so you wouldn't consider filling out a registration form today? What's there to consider? <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think there's one important thing, though. I mean, you have to believe in what you're doing and that it's right. And that would make a difference in this individual's case. But it doesn't mean that just because you believe that, you're going to change his mind. On the basis of one conversation, standing in a line, and I don't care what line it is, or one phone call, or whatever you're doing in terms of, you know, getting people out to vote, one conversation does not generally change a person's mind if they're that set in their pattern. Would you feel different if that person had asked you, would you like to see your family stand in this line? Would that have softened you up just a little bit? Would you see your child in this line? Your vote well, may... Would accept that type of statement. It might be important to point out, by the way, that we're, we're accentuating the negative here, but this gives you the security. Going through these kind of traumatic experiences gives you the security to go on. With unemployment in the greater metropolitan Detroit area at more than 15%, one out of 10 residents old enough to vote is unemployed. Jan and her group are trying to get those people into the voting booths. We need to have people participating in the political process, and if they don't register to vote, they certainly can't participate. There are several groups out there that care about doing things along the lines of voter registration and get out the vote. The NAACP is one of them. Frontlash, the youth organization of the AFL-CIO, is one of them. We all care about getting people in and involved in the process because it will make a difference, and that's why we work together. We don't just work with the NAACP. We work with all kinds of groups that work on voter registration. Voter registration. It's necessary. But I think the, 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 the key thing of what's going to happen with tomorrow, with this entire voter registration effort on this uh, cheese line, is a creation of a tidal wave of uh, new voters that's going to force a political realignment of priorities uh, on both parties by both parties. Really, the main focus was on national policies. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we got to do something to change things. Those mm -hmm. that, you know, were already registered mm -hmm. and wanted to vote believed that they had to in order to change things. In 1980, President Reagan was elected with only 51% of the people voting. The bread box, ballot box, voter registration drive wants to register everyone as registered qualified voters in the city of Detroit. Good morning. Are you registered to vote? Good. How are you, sir? Are you registered to vote also? Well, if just one person goes vote in a community, it's not going to make a whole lot of difference. But if whole communities go out and vote, whole groups of people go out and vote, all union members go out and vote, that's the kind of thing that makes political power. And I'm not certain of where you have to go to vote. Let me know what he's saying. What's wrong with somebody voting in their own self-interest? Because after all, self-interest is I need to have a job. Self-interest is I need to have a place to live. Self-interest is I need to eat. People are going to vote in their own self-interest. Our, our deputy registrars are on the, on the cheese lines right now. This will be done every month, every month from now until the books close in 1984 here in Detroit and, and throughout other communities across the country. At a news conference, so Joe that, Madison, will, political uh, action director for the NAACP, describes plans for a nationwide campaign right to register the poor and unemployed. We're going to concentrate on welfare lines, cheese lines, food stamp lines, in other words, human service type outlets, where the people who are clients of these outlets are the least represented, because the substantial number of this particular group is unregistered and they represent at least 12 million potential votes nationwide. Can I have you raise your right hand? 
I hereby swear and affirm that the statement made within are true. You are a registered voter. Okay, now I need you to raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the information you've given me is true? Yes. Congratulations, you're a registered voter. People have to participate in politics if they're going to make a difference in their lives. If there's one way, any way, that I can help get those people out of that line and into, uh, into a job, you know, that's what I want to do. And I think registering those people to vote will help us make that difference. America Works will continue after this. How important is your vote? In 1960, when Richard Nixon ran for president against John Kennedy, he came up 118,574 votes short. Out of 68 million votes cast, that was a difference of less than two-tenths of a percent. Eight years later, running against Hubert Humphrey, Nixon went through another cliff-hanging election night, this time coming out on top by 510,314 votes. Not every election ends in a photo finish, but the ones that do make American politics fascinating. In 1982, eight contests for the House of Representatives were decided by 1,500 votes or less, and a shift of 70,000 votes out of 2.4 million cast in five Senate races would have changed which party now controls the Senate. Despite these close contests, fewer and fewer of the 164,381,000 Americans eligible to vote are actually doing it. In 1980, for example, voting for presidential candidates reached a 32-year low of 52.9%. During the past 12 years, voter registration declined to the point where only two out of three Americans over the age of 18 had signed up to vote. The search for those 52 million unregistered voters has increased recently, as more groups realize that once people have registered, they tend to vote, regardless of race, economic status, or region. In 1982, Governor Mark White's victory in Texas is credited to the fact that almost twice as many Mexican-Americans voted as did in 1978, most of them for white. New voters also made a difference this year in Denver, where 12,000 new Hispanic registrations helped Federico Pina win the mayor's race by 4,425 votes. The most dramatic demonstration came in Chicago. Citywide registration drives increased the number of blacks eligible to vote by 200,000. Almost 80% of the blacks voted, and an estimated 95% voted for Harold Washington, who won by 46,280 votes. Spurred by these local successes, many voter groups are looking to 1984. Black groups have found that in six states where senators are up for re-election, the margin of victory six years ago was smaller than the number of unregistered black voters. In North Carolina, for example, the victory margin was less than 103,000 but there were 505,000 blacks not registered. Among groups devoting extensive resources to registering voters are the Southwest Voter Registration Project, planning to add one million Hispanics with campaigns in 28 states, and Hispanic Force 84, trying to reach more than one million. The NAACP has set a nationwide goal of more than one and a half million registrations. Reverend Jesse Jackson wants to reach two million potential voters in the South. Reverend Jerry Falwell's moral majority has begun voter registration through churches with a goal of three million new voters. The Democratic Party plans to spend five million dollars over the next two years in hopes of adding five million voters to the rolls. The Republican Party has set its sights on adding three million new voters to the registration lists in 400 key counties across the nation. Who's going to reach these new voters, and with what message in November of 1984, Mr. Knopfsiger? Well, I think that, first of all, uh, we have to recognize that there will be two or three or maybe four candidates out there, and they'll all be trying to reach them. The next thing we have to recognize is that while the program shows that the registration was aimed primarily, primarily at the underemployed or the unemployed, there will be a lot of other people out there registering voters who are employed and who have <clears throat> a different point of view from maybe what these voters have. Uh, I think Lynn is right, but in addition I think there will be these interest groups and some representing uh, a, a wide swath of the political, ideological, mm -hmm. philosophical spectrum. And I think that's mm -hmm. good. We may have seen some 
bottoming out of the decline in voter participation in 1980, and maybe this is the boost we need to get the rates of participation back up. Do I understand you to mean, uh, Mr. Navsika, that there is uh, undue emphasis on people who have been hurt by Reaganomics? Oh, I know, because I don't think people have been hurt by Reaganomics, first of all. But secondly, uh, no, I think that your program here has, uh, in focusing on the unemployed and the underemployed, uh, gives that uh, implication. I think it is fair to say that a great many blacks, and I think this is true for Hispanics as well, feel that given the present uh, economic program, they're hurt worst and first. And uh, so long as they believe that, I think that at all levels of government, not just the presidency, uh, they will be voting their self-interest. Many people today who would say, well, Reaganomics has been hurtful to me, may be saying a year from now, hey, things are looking pretty good, and it was worth it. For a great many uh, low-income Americans, something else will happen to ha have to happen also, and that is the, feel, the feeling that the Republican Party really wants them, wants not only their votes, but really wants them to be a you know, active member, participant in the Republican Party. Well, I think you're absolutely right. I think what the Republican Party has never done well and must do well is to show that it cares. And I think that we have never done a good job on that. And until we do that, then you're going to find minorities and uh, the underemployed and the unemployed uh, registering and voting heavily Democratic. Well, what do you mean by that, that the Republicans have had a difficult time showing they care? Republicans always appear more interested in things and in principles than they are interested in people. That image or that perception, it seems to me, might be softened to some extent if there were not uh, such other realities as the support for uh, abolishing affirmative action programs or reducing the intensity of them, or if there were not support for schools that discriminate, uh, and if there were not uh, other instances in which uh, uh, the administration has come across as uncaring or at least not sensitive. Are Republicans concerned about the activity in voter registration right now? Oh, I am as a Republican because I think that the Democrats uh, and liberal organizations uh, are doing a much better job right now of registering. And I, uh, I think all you've got to do is look at Texas, where Bill Clements got 300,000 more votes two years ago when he lost than he did when he, when he won in 1978, that would be. Mm. And uh, he lost because the Democrats did a better job of registering and getting their voters to the polls. And I don't think that the Republicans have really faced up to that yet. Maybe that will do something to cause the party to be more responsive to some of the interests and concerns of uh, black Americans, Hispanic Americans, and perhaps low-income people. And that really is the way the political process works. That is what it is supposed to do. Are you saying that there are enough new voters ahead to make a difference? I believe that given the momentum that we are seeing in voter registration, uh, it is theoretically possible that, uh, you know, Mr. Mr. Reagan could be defeated. Well, I, agree, I agree with that. I don't think that the president is a, is a cinch to win. And the thing that is bothering me these days is so many Republicans are looking at the economy and saying, aha, Reagan was going to win easily. They are not looking at what is happening in voter registration. They are not looking at key states where Republicans are in deep trouble, such as Michigan, such as Illinois, uh, Ohio, Pennsylvania. Uh, even Iowa, certainly Texas, and, and they're just saying, well, things are going well, and so <clears throat> the president will be reelected. That's the way you lose. But I think one thing that is important uh, when you're talking to new voters, any voters for that matter, is not to overemphasize the significance of the presidential race. It is important. There's just no question about it. But also, up for grabs, uh, uh, you know, a third of the United States Senate, all of the United States House, numerous legislative and local races, and too many people these other offices are far closer to them in terms of where they live than is, than is the presidency. In the case of the Senate and the House, they can prevent the, the, the president from doing things or they can make it possible for him to do things. And we're going to have to look very closely at some of these states because we've got a half a dozen or five senators who are in deep trouble. And uh, we're going to have to look at registration and more importantly than that, or just as importantly, not only registering them, but getting them to the polls on election day. Do you but also change the system? Uh, the, the whole voting procedure? Do you feel that the, the system keeps out certain people? Oh, no. I don't think the system keeps people out at all. I think people stay out of their own accord. But, but I wouldn't change the system. Of course, I disagree <laughs> with that. Mm -hmm. I think in a democratic and open society, the fundamental right to vote should really be unfettered. If a person really wants to vote in most places in this country, he's going to register and go to the polls. 
Well, if you talk to Brad Reynolds, who just got back mm -hmm. from Mississippi, mm -hmm. and you talked about people in that state who had to drive 40 miles one way to register and come back home and then drive another 40 miles to register again, registering twice, it seems to me there is no element of fairness that oh, is I in agree. that. I agree. I agree with and that. And if you look at people mm -hmm. who have to... I said most places. Uh, ...who have to work and uh, other conditions, mm -hmm. I think we can make it more humane. I really do. Mr. Williams, Mr. Nafsiga, thank you so very much. I'll be back in just a moment. At this stage in an election campaign, everyone is optimistic. Each presidential candidate thinks he has the program and the personality to win enough hearts and minds for the nomination, and eventually, the election. Interest groups trying to register new voters are also radiating positive press releases. Taken together, the major organizations say they expect to register an estimated 17 million new voters between now and November 1984. But even if their predictions are viewed skeptically, if their figures are cut in half, for example, the numbers of new voters in 1984 could be very large. While past drives may have faltered, these new groups have real incentives to keep scouring cities and towns for new voters. They've seen results. New voters have made a difference in Texas, Chicago, and Denver. The hallmark for good politicians has been never overlook a potential voter. They may be well advised to start their next campaigns at the county courthouse, where the computers print the lists of eligible voters. Their constituencies may have changed. I'm Marie Torrey. Join me again next week for another edition of America Works.